Hello again, prospective listeners, to another edition of our casual conversa conversations that continue to spark interest across the industry. As always, these series are moderated by myself, Garrett Fisher, and brought to your office, living room, or wherever else you may be listening in this COVID world by the Tappy Young Professional Division. As always, these series try to focus on highlighting the, the necessity of skills deemed as soft in the workplace with the occasional exploration outside of the professional umbrella to understand what habits can help formulate skills you may view as desirable. For any of our new listeners, we delve into the spider web of soft skills by taking this time to sit down with experienced professionals in the paper and allied industries that have really been recognized for their leadership skills. You will hear us discuss the path they took to their soft skills and management development as well as how they manage their skill set outside of work. With members of the YP division moving into more leadership focused roles in recent years, the millennial manager, as I like to call it, you'll hear me say it all the time on these, has never been so prominent in the workplace. We at the Taffy YP division hope that these discussions prove useful to you and give you the confidence to finally apply for that management role you've been holding out because you didn't know how to lead. Without further ado, I have the pleasure today to introduce you to a woman that has utilized her passions, not just in work, but outside of work as well, to truly begin making a difference in this industry. Please welcome Marcina Rogers. Hi, everyone. Thank you for having me, Garrett. I'm excited. Oh, trust me, I am too, Marcina. So, Marcina currently works as the quality technical leader at the International Paper, Paper Mill in Pensacola, Florida. Although I've kept this a secret from Arsena up until now, I may have give her, given her some inkling, but one of the primary reasons I wanted to have this conversation with her was the commitment she has to so many passions. Some of which I think may have something to do with some of her successes inside the paper mill. Let's all be honest. Paper mills can have the habit of pulling you in with that 24 seven operation. So I'd love for our listeners to hear from someone that has struck such a harmonized balance with their passions inside of work as well as out. So Marcino, my first question revolves around your passions outside of work. As I believe the work-life balance is something all young professionals struggle with. Burnout is real, people, let's be honest. An interest outside of work is essential in avoiding it. You have gotten yourself very involved in the Pensacola community, even though you have only been there for a short time. Just look at the in-weekly uh, reward that you were able to receive. The board member of the Keep Pensacola Beautiful is now something that you are involved in, as well as you do a lot of United Ways at uh, United Way events at your work. So, how have you really been able to immerse yourself into a community you are new to so quickly? So. Um... I think a lot of us uh, in undergrad as well, I mean, passions re relied on getting out in the community, helping, seeing what we could do. And, and even being that I went to SUNY USF and the environmental aspect kind of always you stri strikes home with me of how can I continue to better develop, um, you know, leaders and making sure there's an environmental and sustainable focus. Um, so recently, as of last May, so almost up, up to now a year, I've been the board member of Keep Pensacola Beautiful. And actually I found that through friends that I've made outside of work in leadership conferences. So um, last year I attended a women's leadership at one of the local universities here and was able to meet new friends. And actually uh, the executive director of Keep Pensacola Beautiful, I had met when I got my rising star uh, for 2020 of, uh, for Pensacola. And she was like, hey, I really need more board members, are you interested? And I was like, oh, of course, I would love that experience to gain um, some more understanding of the business side. And knowing I was about to start my, my MBA, it kind of all fell in place of, you know, my passions are with, you know, the environment and this would help me get into the local um, communities and, and see what I can do to help and, and have a, a board meeting, which really you think is a lot of work, but it's one meeting a month um, for maybe two hours and, and several several events, right? So could be three a month, could be one a month, depending on the organization. So 
and those are on weekends. So if you don't have weekend duty, it's pretty easy to, to uphold and maintain, uh, making sure you set that aside and keeping it on your schedule. Um, during shift work, that was harder. Um, I would say I, I understand the difficulties with shift work. So as soon as I got off shift, it was, I wanna be more involved. I wanna get in this community. And it's really, you know, finding those opportunities, events, uh, conferences, um, and making friends outside that you can kind of just start talking about your passions and seeing what's out there. Um, I'm, a, I'm also a committee member for, I support the girls who help uh, bring you know, uh, clothing and uh, femme care to homeless and, and women of need. Um, and that's a passion obviously because I make those products, right? So having that opportunity to, to utilize work and, and the people who, who know the products we make and how important they are and getting them out in the community. Uh, we had several fires last year um, when we were in a drought and we were able to help those firefighters who were coming in um, to help us and, and get them products they needed. So, you know, outside of work, and I know um, International Paper does immense work for the community, and I want to continue to do that for myself outside and recognize those, those areas that um, we need leaders in and help move forward. Yeah. Wow, Marcina, just, you know, wow, you really are incredible being able to fit all that outside of work as well. I think, you know, pulling something out of that conversation that I just heard from you was you know, that first step that you have to take in order to really immerse yourself. You know, nobody gets wet without first putting their toe in. You know, just like if you're trying to figure out the temperature of the water, you're going to, you know, put your toe in to figure out, hey, is this really something I want to do? And I think that's what, you know, people really need to take the approach when they get into a new community and maybe you want to get involved in it with it. You got to take that first step. You know, I, I kind of had a very similar experience getting back involved with Tappy. You know, I just felt like, man, I, I really have, They've done a lot for me in my professional career, and I wanted to try and give back as much as I could. And I reached out. I took that first step, and now here we are, a few, you know, about a year later, and now I'm doing these perspective interviews. So you never really know where it's going to take you. And the great part about you is you have that passion and that drive that I think really, you know, you might be putting a toe into the water, but that passion is going to put the, you know, the foot on the gas and the accelerator and really drive you forward. So I appreciate the thoughts, Marcina. Yeah. Most people who know me know that I'm very well known for getting out of my comfort zone. <laughs> so, and I think that's the biggest thing a lot of people can take, um, especially in this day and age is just, it's gonna be uncomfortable for a little, but it, being uncomfortable is not a bad thing. Oh, it's a great thing. So my, my second question is gonna kind of continue with this trend of, you know, your passions, what you do outside of work. So you know, you do show that you have a lot of passion to inspire, you know, the other women out there to get involved in the paper industry. You know, that is a passion of yours. So with that being said, what can industry management do, you know, in future years to promote the growth of women in the paper and allied industries? So I really liked this question because um, you see a lot of company initiatives now striving to hit these goals uh, for diversity and inclusion, not just for women, but other minorities as well. And I find it interesting um, because I, I truly believe it doesn't start with university. It, it starts with elementary school, in the houses and in high school to get, to get the information that women and others need to know that they're capable of doing jobs in STEM. Uh, you have I know some mills who go into elementary schools and teach math classes or do demonstrations and with COVID, obviously that's not happening. But, but marketing paper as, as the benefits that I saw when I was in high school, and I, I'll admit it, I really did not want to go into paper uh, only because my parents were so set on me doing it because I could live at home and go to a state school. But you know, getting into it and getting into my first class of, it was the art and early history of paper making and just finding out the, the history of it and the art, like truly the art and history of making paper and how it's engineered and getting that into schools, I think is really important because the paper industry has so many benefits um, and which is why I chose it right in, in your career path when you get out of school, uh, but as well as the industry as a whole, I think, um, 
understanding that and the myths that come with it and making sure we're all vocal. Um, I think the word of mouth nowadays is very helpful too because of how fast social media and things can spread. Um, but making sure you stay like standing with understanding that you know paper is wanting to continue to be environmental and sustainable and finding ways to, to innovate that every every day. Um, so, I mean, really going back to leaders in the industry, I mean, I think it does start at a lower level than just in, in universities and, and high schools. Yeah, you know, I think, uh, Marcina, you know, again, capturing something from your statements here, you're so moldable when you're young. I mean, let's think of when you're in high school and middle school, you know, when you think of your favorite song in adulthood, where does it fall? Most likely somewhere in that area. I mean, I'll be honest, I'm a Lincoln Park guy. Yeah, I know they went out of style in the early 2000s and maybe late 2000s, I'll give them that, but let's be honest, not something that's recent, but something that really stuck with me when I was a teen and, uh, you know, even early in the middle school area. So I do like that, you, you know, you mentioned that once they've gotten to college, you know, they've, they've kind of set their minds on what they really want to do, but getting them earlier, showing them what, you know, what they could be potentially able to do in the future, I think, is, you know, something that I would always recommend to companies and, you know, maybe put an emphasis if you're, you know, in industry leader right now, potentially put an emphasis on you know, getting your employees, especially, you know, your woman engineers out there, send them to schools and, you know, just talk to a class, be like, hey, here's, here's some career options that you might not be considering. I think it's an absolutely great way to you know, kind of increase involvement um, in the paper industry for years to come. Yeah. Um, I always think back to, to when we were younger, obviously, um, Barbie has changed right now. You can get, you know, a scientist Barbie, you can get an engineer. Um, but back then, Barbies and everything that it used to be, math is hard. And most women you'd find on TV shows saying math is hard. But then I was like, well, I love math. <laughs> and, and having my, my parents, my family, and then even teachers, uh, female teachers encouraging math and science um, is huge. Yeah, I totally agree with you. I think the uh, what we want to take away from this is uh, paper industry leaders invest in the future. Yes. So, Marcina, my last question that I'm going to ask you in terms of your passions outside of the paper mill is regards to you know furthering your education. So a lot of people on this call are probably wondering, I see Marcina wearing a Penn State shirt. I didn't know Penn State even had a paper school. Well, guess what, guys? That's not what this is about. Marcina has decided that, you know, now that she's been outside of school for a few years, she wants to now tackle an MBA. Like many people, there's always something that she wants to put herself and make that next goal, make herself uncomfortable, reach newer heights. You know, we all get it. So, you know, what was your biggest motivator, Marcina, in getting that MBA? And then also, you know, for individuals that are looking to round themselves out in the business world as well, you know, what are some tips that you might have in regards to their program search, i.e., why did you choose Penn State? Uh, so the first part of that, I'll start with, um, and my, my first thought to get an MBA was actually my undergrad. Uh, having these dreams, being in paper, you know, moving my way up, um, understanding and, and understanding the business and the industry as a whole. Um, at Tappy events, seeing, you know, different, different speakers and understanding where they came from and not necessarily having just an engineering background, but maybe a finance background and, and the critical roles they play in these successful companies in the industry. And, and that's kind of when I first was like, well, I want to get my MBA. Um, but a lot of the, the conversations that are had of undergrads um, when asked, you know, should I stay and get my MBA now or do I even need an MBA? Um, most, in, most professionals will tell you, you don't need an MBA, uh, especially in the paper industry. And so I, I've heard that a lot as well. And, and it was almost discouraging at a point, right? And, and seeing like, well, okay, I, I know I'm getting the exposure I need, uh, but I wanted to take that to a different level and get that degree because um, obviously expanding yourself, like you said, Garrett, and, and continuing to develop yourself is, is huge and critical. And 
and in a classroom setting, as well as continuing to work, is huge because you can you can utilize it day in and day out. And this current role that I'm in with this quality technical leader position, I was starting to get exposure to supply chain and uh, customer service as, as I deal with the customers all the time um, and the finance group and, and pricing and, uh, and all of those different aspects of the business. And I really wanted to kind of exponentially grow myself quicker in understanding these business sides that, and these conversations I'm having um, and being part of. I never had sat in on a supply chain meeting call um, and other, the, and other business um, calls. And, and seeing that, I was really excited and I was like, all right, it's time to start. And with COVID, I was like, well, we're all at home anyway, so might as well uh, start now. Um, so with the choices I had made for college uh, and choosing Penn State, I had three schools, really, I was looking at. Um, they were Florida State, Auburn, and then Penn State. And maybe my choice is, is funny. Um, I, being that I'm in the South, I didn't really want to go to an SEC school uh, because of the competition. Um, but I also did want to go to a well-named, well-respected uh, online program. And Penn State is, you know, top four, has the longevity and the reputation, uh, has the alumni as well. Uh, it just overall has, a, has been a well-developed program. Um, and I can still, you know, go on, go and go to the university and graduate and walk on stage. They don't, just because it's an online degree, it doesn't hold me back any. Um, and it is a big 10 school. I mean, great reputation, like I said, and it just overall, it just kind of fit when I started listening to these, you know, uh, individuals that I had, you know, conversations with and interviews with. Um, but it also helped that I didn't have to take a GRE or GMAT. So, uh, depending on when you want to get your MBA, uh, additional recommendation I have: uh, if you have leadership experience and if you've been in the industry for a while. So, with four years of experience and uh, two years of leading crews. Uh, I was able to, to get, um, uh, I didn't have to take the GREs or GMAT, I got an exception. Uh, so that was very helpful. So that, that would be good to always look into as well, depending on how much time you have. Well, talk about making the best of a not so great situation. Uh, you know, I go back to, although COVID has been a heck of a time for a lot of people out there in the world, I would say that I have heard more positivity. And again, I've done most of these calls during COVID. I've heard more positive positivity throughout this year than I think I've ever heard before. I mean, most people have taken this time to, you know, conquer a life goal of theirs or you know, get themselves healthier in some way or another. I mean, it's, it's just incredible, even though we've all been put under such stresses of COVID, you know, to see even you, Marcina, you know, going out and being like, you know what, I'm at home, so let's get an MBA done. Uh, again, I think it's just incredible. Thank you. Now that we've really talked mostly through all of your passions in life, so, you know, the ones that help you maintain that elusive work-life balance we all wish for, I'd like to move on to, you know, one or two questions about the soft skills you've developed to really, you know, get that leadership role at such a young age. So with that being said, what attributes have you developed in your professional career that has helped draw success to you? So I thought about this one for a while. Um, and I get, you know, these questions, this one's kind of generic almost in a sense, a little bit. Um, but it's always brought me back to my first, within my first month of working for IP. And we had a vice president speaking to us. And her comment of success was make things happen. And I always go back to that in every role I'm in and even day, day in and day out, if I can walk, leave the mill and go home and said, I did something, I made a change or I made something happen. It, it just by far brings me, you know, closure in myself, but also I think shows day in and day out that I'm action oriented and driving for results to make those things happen and, and continue to drive us forward, um, not as a company, but, you know, as a mill and, and who I am, you know, it might not be, it might be a bad day for the mill, 
But if you can walk out and say, hey, that experience I had, it, it developed me in some way, that's still a win and you made something happen for sure. Those are the big three things that I think have stuck with me and, and have brought success for sure. Yeah, I don't know if you uh, noticed the subtlety that I introduced in this question where you know I mentioned drawing success to you. I'm a big non-believer in what people, a lot of people out there call luck. Um, I think, yeah, it might exist in, let's say the uh, million dollar jackpot, but how many people actually win something like that? I think that you know the people that actually are successful out there, it all starts with the healthy habits and you know the doers of the world. I think that those two in combination are really what helped draw it. It's like a you know you're a Venus flytrap at that point. You're just trying to you know, get that success to pick you and be like, okay, yep, I'm going to be successful now because I've set myself up with the healthy habits. I'm going to go out there and I'm going to get stuff done. Those are the individuals that I think I see the you know build the success off. So again, I think we've kind of established at this point that the work-life balance is really the core focus of this discussion. Um, and it really does hinge a lot on a, on a leader's ability to delegate to their team. So as you seem to be a master of striking this balance, how do you successfully delegate to your team, Marcina? So I think shift work, I mean, you hear, so many people talk about the benefit of going on shift. And, and I always wanted to go on shift and lead teams um, and be a manager, um, a little bit different, right? From the, the general engineering aspect. Um, but the people side, the interpersonal skills, I love them. They're, they're fantastic. I'm a people person as an engineer. And, and understanding your team is critical. And even if it takes a little longer to, uh, to you know, read a few development books and understand how, how to size people up and understand their strengths and opportunities for development um, is, is huge. And seeing that and having those conversations, because really sometimes it's, it's really hard to see until you sit down with your employees and, and your team to, to understand where they want to be and what they want to do. And so recently, um, as of this month, I've actually gained two team members to my team. So now I have three individuals and they range from almost a 40 year um, nearing retirement uh, technician hourly to an intern still in college to an engineer almost two years out of college or a year out of college. And so there, there's a wide range of skills and experience and understanding your team members, um, you know, strengths and abilities to do, to do what they need to do um, and even to continue to develop themselves and push them to those limits. And so when delegating, for me at least, uh, especially today with it, me taking, taking off or having a half day, um, you know, spreading out the roles and understanding, all right, I need to inspect this. Well, this person has these skills and it's a great opportunity for them to further their development. I, you know, I have my phone, they can call me or, you know, this analysis is a great opportunity for this person. Um, you know, understanding where those, those opportunities lie to, con to develop your team is huge. And seeing that um, really helps with delegation. Uh, even if you have to sometimes hold their hand through it, it might feel stressful and worse at times, but it, it really isn't uh, in the end because then the next time that task comes up, they're skilled in it and they can do it. Um, and that really helps uh, being able to get things done and, and show your team moving forward, not just you as an individual. Yeah, I think, uh, like I said, our conversations thus far have shown me that you're exactly right. You know, you're a total people person, Marcina. And I, I totally agree with you. I think that in order to be able to delegate to your team, you really need to know who they are, what their strengths, what their weaknesses are. And, you know, that always starts with, you know, being that individual that's going to you know, make those conversations with that person, get to know them a little bit inside and outside of work so that you can better understand, you know, what has, you know, what it has created their you know, weaknesses and their strengths. And then also, I think, you know, 
that helps delegation, but it also helps you to understand where do I need to put effort in to help develop this person in some of their weak spots. Uh, I think it's you know kind of a it, it works both ways there. So guys, we're getting to the end, unfortunately, but I think I got one more question that is really gonna make people think. And uh, it's one of those big questions. So it's moving beyond what we as leaders can do for our teams, our mills, or even our industry as a whole. What I wanna ask Marcina is, what do you view as the most important action that leaders in the paper industry can perform to positively impact this entire world? taken on the world now, <laughs> not just paper. So this is a great question. Sorry. Um, I think that um, being able to be innovative, do you want me to pause? So being able to be innovative and creative, uh, our market is constantly changing and growing. And, and you can see environmentally how things are impacting our industry. So my original comment that I wrote down for this was making sure we keep safety and environmental in our forefront. Uh, I think that goes without saying almost because that is pretty much what we've embedded in, in paper is we are sustainable. We're in a renewable um, aspect of the, of the world um, and continuing to be sustainable and continuing to keep people safe in a manufacturing setting because we still are um, highly um, you know, man-powered and machine-powered. And bringing those two together, you need to make sure that safety is in the forefront. Um, but on the other side, you know, the, without you know, taking those um, on the side for a second, I think being innovative and creative um, with what we're producing and getting out to the to the world um, is going to be very, very uh, important as we move forward in, in this constantly changing environment where, um, you know, social media is heavily pre present um, with what any with one person could say and spread something viral. Um, but we can do that on the positive side too, making sure we continue to stay in, ahead and, and be great as a, you know, part of the community as well. Well, thank you very much for those comments there, Marcina. I think uh, the one that stands out to me the most is I, you know, I knew that safety and environmental was gonna come up in this conversation about what we can do to, you know, impact the world with our industry. But I think it's, you know, what you bringing in the innovation aspect of the paper industry is really, I don't think something a lot of people think of. And I, I kind of appreciated that. A lot of people that I've ever talked to about, you know, when I work in the paper industry, they're like, okay, you work at Dunder Mifflin and you sell coffee. You know, that's, that is the worldwide knowledge of what we do. And, you know, to show people that we're more than just individuals that can produce a sheet of white paper that you get to print out on your printer in six months, I think is really important and something that we need to, you know, utilize to drive the world. You know, for everyone that doesn't, that maybe might know, something that I think was pretty cool that the paper industry is, you know, kind of rolling out is the first truly 100% paper bottle supposed to be coming out this year for, uh, you know, holding uh, liquor. I believe it's uh, like Jim Walker or something like that. Uh, so it's it's th those kind of things that I think are really driving that sustainability piece home. And I really appreciate, you know, us trying to change the worldview of what the paper industry Once again, listeners, our time has sadly come to an end. I and the YP division would really like to extend our thanks to Marcina for sitting down with us today. Marcina, do you have any last words of advice to our listeners? Uh, I just want to say, no matter where you are, I think having mentors and mentees as you move forward, you can learn a lot from everyone. Um, so asking questions and getting out there, you can reach out to me as well through LinkedIn. Um, I'm always happy to help and encourage. Well, guys, we certainly hope that you found this discussion to be useful. And please check out more Perspectives content by visiting the Tappy Young Professional website and clicking on that YP Perspectives link. 
Thanks again for listening, everyone, and we hope to see you again soon.